Okay. So, hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the uh, Art Journal Club again. Today we'll have Nicholas Reed, which is me. <laughs> um, and today we'll be doing an introduction to astro seismology, which I hope is going to be good because, you know, basically we've just had a bunch of relativity talks all in a row. And I assure you that this is not going to have any relativity in it, I promise. Uh, so, what we're going to be doing today is I want to motivate basically. Why, what astro seismology is, why is it cool, um, why do we think of it as a really useful tool, um, and I'm going to derive some of the major formulas uh, like that, that are in this field, and this is basically just sort of the base knowledge for uh, working in astro seismology, and then time permitting, I'm going to talk about like the effects of things like rotation and magnetism, uh, which I work on. Um, and so, to be honest, I haven't timed this, I don't know how long this is going to take, and the point is that I've ordered the information in, uh, you know, in order of most to least important, with the most important information being, in my opinion, really important, and the least important information being not so important. So you should feel free to stop me at any time. The priority is not to get through all of it. The priority is to make sure that all the steps make sense. So if you have any questions at all about anything, or even like minor steps, like I promise you I've spent hours uh, agonizing over every single one of those things. So. Yeah, uh, basically, what is astro seismology? So the word is spelled like this. There's an E here for some reason. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, there's an E. And, and what it is is basically the seismology, uh, or you know, the study of the oscillations of stars, astro. And you recognize that from astrophysics. Because, you know. <laughs> um, so, Astro seismology is the study of the oscillations of stars. It's sort of analogous to like seismology, which is the study of earthquakes. Um, and it's really interesting because if you if you really step back and think about it, this may be not the best thing to say in front of this audience, but most of our information about space comes from electromagnetic radiation. It comes from light. You know, things emit light somehow, and then we look at it. You know, it's either photometry or it's spectroscopy. It's in the X rays and radio. It may all seem really different. Um, but most of it's light, you know, you've got neutrinos and gravitational waves, but who cares about those? Nobody, right? <laughs> so, um, but the problem with that is like, let's say I got a star and I want to like learn things about the star. So I, I look at the star, you know, I'm an eyeball, I look at a star. Um, the problem is that light from a star quite famously comes from the surface of the star, what's up? Um, and not the center of the star. So if I want to get information, about a star, like for example, I want to measure its temperature or something like that, I'm only going to, like, it, it's very hard to think of a way that I can directly probe the inside of the star, you know. Uh, I'm only really thinking about, I'm only really getting information about, you know, the surface temperature, you know, maybe the density of the surface, maybe I do, you know, Zeeman spectroscopy and I get the magnetic field at the surface, which is going to be a lot different than what, is it, what it is inside. Now the thing is, um, you can be a bit clever about this because you can sort of think, okay, like, like maybe we can think about an Earth example when I got like a bell. If I ring this bell, okay, well, if I, first of all, if I look at this bell, you know, with a telescope or something, I'm going to be able to get some amount of information. I'm going to know, um, you know, what color is the bell, you know, what's probably what the bell's made of on the outside, what shape is the bell, how big is the bell, if I know the distance and so on. But if I ring the bell and I listen to the bell, you know, that's a way of knowing about what's inside the bell, getting some constraint, because, you know, if the bell's, uh, you know, hollow or if it's full, um, that's going to sound a lot different, right? And so this intuition is the same for a star, you know, if I watch a star's oscillations, you know, by, you know, looking at its light curve or something like that, um, then even though I'm only getting light from the surface of the star, those surface oscillations are inherently tied to the core's oscillations, and therefore, uh, you'll be able to extract information from astro seismology about what's inside the star. Uh, so, you know, that's basically, uh, you know, a reason, this, that's basically the main thrust of astro seismology, you know, why we care about it. Um, and you can sort of think, maybe you remember from middle school that people talk about, like, uh, you know, using P waves and S waves to figure out, you know, what parts of the Earth are liquid and so on, and it's analogous to that. Okay. So um, what I'd first like to do is derive the dispersion relation for uh, you know, the oscillations that a star can have. And the two forces that we're really going to be incorporating here, let me move this over, are going to be um, pressure, which is you know, just like the restorative force for normal sound waves that we're used to, and buoyancy. 
So, you know, if I like put a rubber duck in the bathtub and I push it down, it's gonna come back up. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, the way that these calculations typically go and the way that this one's going to go is we're going to write down the fluid equations, we're going to linearize them, and we're going to find the oscillation modes, right? And so, um, First, let me make some definitions. So in fluid dynamics, it's common, of course, to derive, uh, to uh, define this uh, convective derivative, which is basically just the, the derivative that follows along with the fluid. Uh, and uh, so defining this, we can write down the important equations that are, are necessary. So we can write down the continuity equation, which is just, you know, this statement that um, if I, if the density is changing inside a little box, then it has to have gone somewhere, uh, essentially. And yes, the row is supposed to be on the outside because this is a convective derivative, but it turns out not to matter. Uh, so this is continuity. Maybe I should. Uh, there is momentum, which is just F equals MA. And there's going to be a, gra a gravity term, right? Because we, we want to you know, incorporate that. And so we're gonna have, yeah, this. Uh, and then we're going to need another equation. So the unknowns that we have here are we have rho, we have p, and then we have the, the three components of u. And, we, and uh, you know, u is like sort of like one variable. So we have two equations, we need a third one, and that third one is intuitively are going to tell you, you know, basically how are, are the pressure and the density related. They're the equation of state. I'm sure you've never heard of that before. Um, and uh, so we have, so this is momentum. And then we have uh, this. Uh, so this is uh, intuitively what this is, is like, if I have like a little parcel that its pressure is like some constant times its uh, density to some power. Now this is really important and something which is confusing for a long time, right? But you might be tempted to think, okay, th like this is like truly a constant and like throughout the entire star, everything has like some kappa. Um, you wanna be kind of careful because if every parcel in the entire star has this same kappa, it turns out there's no buoyancy. Like, because you know, if I like, you know, lift up a little blob of fluid, it's going to like become the same, uh, density as its surroundings, and then there's not going to be any restorative force at all. So this kappa is different for different fluid parcels. So you might hear some terminology, like people will say, like, um, uh, you know, the lowest entropy things sink to the bottom of, the, like, the center of the star, or, like, you should sort your star by entropy after stellar merger. That kind of language is, um, is encoded in this kappa. So this kappa uh, depends on which fluid parcel you're talking about. But following a fluid parcel, like, uh, under, like, this, I guess, adiabatic approximation, uh, this is a constant for yeah that one parcel. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to linearize these equations. So this is energy, and this is the standard approach because uh, the main uh, difficulty in fluid dynamics is that the equations are not linear. So maybe uh, one way of tackling the problem is to make that go away because that's allowed, uh, I guess. So uh, what we can do is we can first take this uh, first equation. Why don't we, um, we can linearize it. And it, if we do this in spherical coordinates, it will turn out that we'll have rho prime over rho. I'm just sort of skipping a few steps. Basically, you, um, actually, let me, let me say this. Um, so rho is going to be some slowly varying profile with r, uh, and only a function of r, uh, and then also like some perturbation, which is a function of everything. Uh, and then same with p prime. Sorry, sorry, not not that. Uh, you know, so on. And then u is is just going to be u because the equilibrium, uh, you know, fluid uh, fluid uh, motion is zero. And I'm actually going to be working with this c coordinate, uh, which is uh, basically the fluid displacement uh, defined this way. This is just uh, something that's kind of convenient. Um, and one more thing that I want to say is when we uh, do these sorts of problems, we want to find the normal modes. And so uh, one convenient thing to do is to assume that everything has a uh, time dependence, which is harmonic. So everything, every perturbation goes like this. Okay. 
Uh, this is just for simplicity. Sorry, this is a lot of steps I'm not writing down. Basically, we take this, we assume this dependence on the perturbations, we plug everything in, and we only keep terms which are first order in the perturbations. So the zeroth order terms will like make an equilibrium structure equation, and we don't, we're not going to worry about that. Um, and we're only going to keep all the first order terms. So the continuity equation in spherical coordinates becomes um, this thing. So this uh, this is supposed to be like a del but with an h subscript, and that's just the horizontal part of the divergence. Um, I'll be using that letter uh, a lot, that simple a lot. Uh, we'll have the momentum equation. So this is basically uh, what it looks like. Um, so this is the radial part. Um, and so this is like you know the second time derivative here uh, is equal to the forces. And then we have the same thing, but for the horizontal part. And it's going to be the same thing, but um, there's not going to be any gravity, because gravity points down, I, I've been told, authoritatively by my gravity friends. And then finally, we're going to have the energy equation. This one's a little bit tricky. What we're going to do is, um, if you, you sort of like plug in your perturbations and everything, uh, you will get something like this, rho prime over uh, plus over rho is equal to p prime over gamma p naught equal to the fluid per, uh, fluid displacement one over gamma d l n p naught d r. So this is like the equilibrium uh, configuration, uh, and then this. Okay, uh, so this is energy, um, and one thing I should say is uh, we have assumed. That, the column approximation, so there's there's no um, perturbation in the gravitational potential itself. G is like legitimately a constant with radius. You know, in practice, this is not actually true, but, but um, people make this approximation a lot, and it's supposed to be fine, maybe. Um, so one thing is this: this looks kind of ugly, but maybe I should say that this bit. Uh, this is also called. Um, 1 over g times the bridge by sala frequency squared. Okay, so this, uh, it, you know, basically what this is, right, is, um, let's see, like, so let's say you have, like, uh, you know, some blob of fluid within some other fluid, and in equilibrium, it's, like, right where it needs to be. But if I, like, nudge it up and down a bit, if I, like, nudge it up, if that fluid, uh, you know, adiabatically you know, changes its density but remains denser, becomes denser than the surroundings, then it's going to fall back down. It's going to come back down here. It's going to be denser. It's going to be less dense than its surroundings, and it's going to basically wiggle around. And that's the case where uh, n is a uh, n squared is a you know positive number, so n is a real number. However, if n squared is less than zero, this is like convectively unstable. You know, you go up basically, but you become less dense than your surroundings, so you keep going up forever, and then you have a fluid instability, and then you know you basically have a convective region. So that's 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 some details, but basically the idea is that this is where the bridge by Salis frequency enters in, and I can rewrite this equation in a way that I like, which is the pressure uh, perturbation is equal to the density perturbation times the sound speed squared. Uh, minus rho naught n squared cs squared over g cr and um, cs is this is the standard definition uh, for polytrope um, and so so if you look at this you're like okay I think I can intuitively understand this right because if I don't look at this part this is pretty pretty like this is sort of like the definition of cs this is like uh, you know dp d rho or something like that. Um, and so this is basically like the the change in the pressure due to the fact that the density of your fluid is like changing, but this part is because uh, as you if you like displace your fluid upwards, then at a given point the fluid the fluid parcel you're looking at is actually a different fluid parcel. It has a different kappa and everything, and so this sort of accounts for that, right? So this 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 term is quite important, and uh, I have lost it many times. So yeah. Um, 
So, you know, here are the equations that we want to solve. These ones. I'm going to do it over here. Does anyone want this? Probably not. I don't want it. Okay. So one thing you might find to be quite annoying. Uh, let's see. Am I missing? I forgot to say something. Okay, we're going to take an aside to do some math that you probably already know about. But if you haven't gotten the memo, we're going to do spherical harmonics, just in case. So um, let's forget about the radial part. Let's just write down the uh, spherical Laplacian. And let's say that there's some function y, and we want to find basically the eigenfunctions of this thing. Turns out that this, is, this would be quite nice to know. R squared sine theta d theta sine theta dy d theta r squared sine squared theta dy squared d phi squared. Okay, so um, this is quite nice because this is um, like legitimately just you know um, like this is very simple. There's no dependence on phi like anywhere. There's no explicit dependence on phi anywhere in our equations. And that reflects the fact that uh, you know our equations are axisymmetric. You know, if you rotate the star, uh, then like th there's no like special zero point for phi, and basically that means we can take y to be e to the i m phi. Uh, and what you'll get when you plug that in, let's say that uh, like it's this times some function uh, phi, uh, then we'll have One over r squared sine theta sine theta df d theta, uh, and then minus, and then this brings down uh, i m twice, and uh, we're going to say that like um, one one thing that you can sometimes do is you can say mu is equal to cosine theta, blah 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 blah. Plug it in. And you'll get this equation. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see. And I've, like, you know, multiplied the r over and, like, sort of absorbed in this constant. Uh, and this is the Legendre equation, or this is the generalized Legendre equation. And the important thing to know is that yes, you you have this quantum number m, but this actually can only take uh, values l, l plus one, l is you know one two so on, um, zero one two so on, such that um, l has to be bigger than the absolute value of m, or bigger than or equal to the absolute value of m. Um, all of that is to say, okay, like you know, who cares? This is solved by associated Legendre polynomials. And so, you know, you have your spherical harmonics. That is to say, like, we're, we're going to use this information just a little bit to basically get rid of all of the spherical, you know, stuff. You know, we only want to care about the radial direction. Uh, and so that's just sort of a, a brief overview. Um, yeah, so I'm going to erase this part. Hopefully I don't need it again. I probably do. Okay, so um, so the first thing we can do is, so I, I literally just erased this, but it's fine. So this is the uh, horizontal momentum equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply, I'm going to take the, the divergence of this in the angular direction. So I'm going to basically act this guy. I'm going to get minus rho omega squared, uh, this thing is equal to this. Now if I, um, yeah, so, so this, is, this is nice because this, this appears in the continuity equation. And I can just divide everything over and you get uh, this, okay, which I'm going to soon plug into the continuity equation. 
Uh, and then I'm also going to do another thing, which is I'm going to take my energy equation, which I've also erased, uh, and solve for rho uh, prime. So this is just something algebraic, you know, I divide uh, the sound speed of squared over and uh, move it to one side. Which is this guy. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug them all into um, the continuity equation. So as you might recall, the continuity equation has a row prime in it, it has this divergence in it, and we're going to basically get rid of everything, uh, make it into uh, you know, a single equation. Uh, in terms of the variables C, R, and P, these guys. So we plug them in. And conveniently, we have our equations. Uh, we have an equation which relates you know, the der derivative of Xr to Xr, P, and there's this thing, but if we assume that uh, you know, everything is, uh, you know, basically this, this, this we've just figured out, like uh, it's just L times L plus one over R squared. Uh, and so what you, you'll end up getting after sort of solving for this thing, plugging in that, uh, what I just said, is you'll get um, this equation. Let me, actually this is an important one, so let me put it in a, a location that I hold dear and box it. Oh, so let me actually, no, sorry. This is equation number one. That is a single derivative. I'm sorry. Are there any questions so far? At all? Any steps? I mean, it's a lot of algebra. I guess I'm sort of skipping over a lot of it because it's boring. Um, basically, the motivation is, you know, we just want to find, uh, you know, two equations which are relating the derivatives of two perturbations to those perturbations again. And the way that we'll get the second one is we'll simply go to the uh, radial momentum equation. Uh, and so what that's just going to be is, oh, um, I should say one thing. This SL squared is called the Lamb frequency squared. It's like the frequency of Lamb waves or whatever. And it's defined to be this thing. L times L plus one over R squared CS squared. This is the square of the Lamb frequency. And what this is, uh, right, is, um, okay, so if you think of this thing as KH squared, like we just call it this, then this is basically sort of like an acoustic wave, like, but with, with respect to the um, horizontal wave number, which is going to be like, this thing is sort of like on the order of one over R, basically. So this is just one of one of the characteristic frequencies that matters besides the Brunvik Zala frequency. Uh, and then what we can do is uh, we can go to our energy equation, uh, which we can plug into our radial momentum equation. So basically, this was an equation that we had. This is this is um, this is the momentum equation in the radial direction. Uh, we can, what you can do basically is you can take this, stick into here like the energy equation, and you'll get dp dr as a function of this and pressure. And we, we can write that down, and what we'll get is this thing. So this is our second equation, which is kind of important. So some of you are interested in high energy physics and care about precision a lot, I've been told, so avert your eyes, uh, because uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this and say, okay, uh, what, suppose, supposing that the radial wave number, like, 
is a lot bigger than whatever equilibrium quantities you know exist then what we're going to do is we're just going to say like well this is kind of hard to solve uh, but suppose that this didn't exist and suppose that this also didn't exist because these are like basically this is a derivative like this is sort of like a one over the pressure scale height or something this is like one over r which is big uh, or, or small uh, uh, I'm sorry yeah r is big so one over r is small this is you know something similar like that and then we're going to assume that this stuff doesn't depend on radius so I'm just going to plug one of these equations into the other I'm going to get something which is really foundationally important in astroseismology, which is what I've been trying to derive this whole time, uh, if you'll believe me. And another way of writing this is supposing like CR varies uh, with like e to the minus ikr uh, r or so. And then this is, uh, you can write, write this as kr squared cs squared equal to one over omega squared, omega squared minus n squared, omega squared minus sl squared. Okay, so this is important. This is sort of like the dispersion relation for uh, oscillations which can be restored by pressure or points. Okay. That was maybe a little fast. Does anyone have any questions about this at all? Any part of it? Like what, what do these symbols mean? How do you, why? No. Yeah. So, so hold on a second. So CR doesn't depend on theta and phi. Right, because we've already assumed uh, that the oh, angular power okay. dependence. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good? Okay. So, I mean, we can look at this and uh, first of all, like this is really shady, right? So we've done a lot of really stupid things which may or may not be okay. And we basically assume most of the time that they are okay, but you know, one can be you know, cautious anyway. Um, this is a very valuable heuristic for deciding how it is that oscillations can look inside of a star. So for example, uh, let's consider the, this is not necessary anymore because it contains no content of any interest to us. Um, suppose that we have the case that uh, omega, let's say omega squared, is much bigger than the two characteristic frequencies that are in this equation. Okay. So basically what I'm saying is suppose this term is basically omega squared, suppose this term is also basically omega squared, omega squared divided by, times omega squared divided by omega squared is just going to be this. And um, remember, we have assumed basically that the radio wave number is the, the big wave number. And so this is basically like acoustic waves. These are also called P modes. Okay. And let's see, did I point out anything that are interesting? No. Well, P modes are P modes. Um, they're basically just like sound waves that are restored by pressure. And then we've got something else. We've got an opposite regime. Suppose that omega squared is much less than n squared SL squared. And you know, I'm even being generous, so why don't we just say slightly bigger, whatever, who cares? Okay. Then what's gonna happen is you're going to have um, n squared dominates this term, uh, SL squared dominates, uh, but what, what else SL squared is just CS squared times KH squared. And basically when the smoke clears, you're going to have this. which is the dispersion relation for gravity waves. You know, you can just do it in Cartesian and that's what it is. Now you might say, okay, Nicholas, well, look, actually, uh, I, I think some comments are in order because gravity waves, first of all, gravity waves are not gravitational waves. Unfortunately, if you work in my field and you Google the name of your own topic, for some reason, it will always be like, do you mean gravitational waves and people well-meaning people like Searle will write papers that are like up, called like gra gravity waves and then it will be about gravitational waves. And you're 
like that <laughs> or whatever, because you know artists are not appreciated or something. <laughs> so uh, one thing which is kind of interesting to note is that if L is equal to zero, right? So S L squared is equal to L times L plus one over R squared, and that's zero. This is zero. This is zero. Uh, and therefore, it is impossible to satisfy this condition. Okay, and so you won't have. There are no like G modes, basically. You can't have G modes for purely radial uh, oscillations. So that's one comment. Another comment is you might be thinking, okay, technically n squared can still be negative. Okay, so then what happens then? So if we're in a convective zone, uh, you know, yeah, basically, um, this also you, you also can't do this. Okay. You can't satisfy this, and so you, know, you will also not have G modes. But, yeah. Um, cool. Okay, and there's one other regime which I haven't mentioned, but which is quite important, uh, is that if omega squared is like in between the two, uh, then if you look at this. Um, like the actual factor is not so important because you know you're not necessarily much bigger, much smaller than any of these. But what you are is this is this right hand side becomes negative. It doesn't matter which which one is higher, which one's lower, as long as you're between them. One of these terms is negative, and what you'll have is like you know k r you know is imaginary, and and you'll have like an evanescent wave. So one way, one typically typical way to visualize erase the top one. So like so, uh, one thing I should say is like given an L, these uh, two frequencies basically encode like the oscillation structure of the star. So I can just plot them, for example, like this. I can plot like you know the frequency omega of a mode and the radius of the star, and you know your your um, your grid by cell frequency will sort of be like this shape, like for a red giant, for example. Uh, like this will be the radiative zone. And, and then you'll have like your lamb frequency, which is sort of like generally decreasing like this. And for a mode, just by definition, it only has one value of omega, and so we just draw a straight line and we were like, okay, well, what is this? So here we're gonna have you know some oscillation which is like a P mode. And then what we're gonna have is like it becomes evanescent for some for some you know region. That's not that's terrible. Wow. It's gonna be like, you know, and then it's going to become a G mode. So it's gonna be propagating again. Um, this is like this is like a like a picture called like a propagation diagram. You look in astro seismology; they're everywhere, and basically make the point that, like, you know, if you draw a straight line, what do you expect the behavior of your mode to be? Okay. Um. Let's see. Did I want to say anything else about this? Yes, I did. Okay. So one thing which you know we've derived the entire structure of the star, but perennially the problem is always going to be how do you learn what's inside a star? Because yes, as a theorist, I can figure out oh, how I expect the inside of the star to behave, but I'm always only going to be observing the oscillations at the surface of the star. So, uh, so like, if the what I'm saying basically is that if the evanescent region is really wide, like if this if the wave spends a lot of time exponentially decaying, uh, then I'm basically not going to get all that in in much information about the inside of the star. You know, I can say like hypothetically the the waves couple to the inside, but you know, in practice it might be very difficult. We basically like situations where these two frequencies at some range like become pretty similar, and so you'll have an evanescent region, but it will be pretty small. And um, it turns out that for situations like red giants, this just happens to be true. That's very nice because uh, you'll get these things. Uh, I think colloquially we say it, you'll have these things called mixed modes, and people will say language like, um, you know, you have a G mode and it couples to a P mode at the surface, 
and therefore, you know, you get multiple G modes coupling to a P mode or like stuff like that. And then you're like, you're sort of thinking like, okay, these must be like separate oscillations on separate things, but they're the same function. It's just that, you know, what we're saying is that you have some radial function here and then an evanescent region and then a different function here. So like, it's like, you know, this is just like roughly morphologically the same as, uh, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is basically it's all this it's all one function but when I say mixed mode I just mean there's an evanescent region that's quite small and so the frequency of the oscillation itself uh, of a visible oscillation is very dependent on the uh, you know the G mode structure of the star yeah it kind of looks like I don't know if you want to go into this at all but it looks yeah. like the approximations you make to get to this stage break down exactly the evanescent region yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, probably. Uh, is this like actually a problem? I, I don't know. Wait, so let me let me think about this. Um, yeah, because you're saying like there are these these terms basically go to zero. Yeah, the terms that were supposed yeah. to be big are now going to zero. Yeah, it's probably fine. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like the thing is like okay, I write down this thing right, and then it's like okay, maybe these terms are small, and then there are other terms that I ignored. But those other terms are like on the order of like one over r or whatever, and this is supposed to be something big, and if big equals small, then small is zero, right? Whatever. <laughs> like, this is, like, we're doing the best with what we got in Astro, right? <laughs> um, any, any other questions about anything? This is a natural stopping point because in my notes, I have demarcated this as uh, section two. So uh, this was section one, basically. And so if any of these steps are unclear, I mean, this is, I think, pretty important understanding. Like, I draw this picture, I draw N, and I draw SL, and I think it's, it's, it's important to understand why it's these two frequencies that I draw and uh, what is implied, right? That's clear? Wait, so, so yeah. when you look at this, are the, is the, the amplitude of the mode the largest in, at the, in the center of the star? Uh, not necessarily. In oh. fact, the ones you observe, uh, like you expect, like the easiest modes to observe are always the ones that are like high amplitude of the surface. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know if this was clear, right? What you do is you watch the star, you watch its brightness change, or you watch the radial velocity change at its surface. I think I'll, I'll say this in a second, actually. Uh, and then take a Fourier transform or whatever, and you can get that information. Um, but obviously, you can't do that if you have a G mode that's sort of knocking around in the core and then it decays exponentially before it gets to the surface. You can't see it. Okay. All that clear? Okay, I'm going to go on and I'm going to uh, derive a few even shadier things, unfortunately. Sorry. Which slide should I erase? Uh, this one. I just drew this. Okay, so I want to make a few comments. So uh, this is gonna be a very generic statement about what oscillation modes are. Right, which is uh, basically, let's say I have like a well, and then I have an oscillation in it. Well, I impose a boundary condition on both sides of it, and I expect there to be a quantization condition. You know, I expect there to be a quantum number. And so uh, one thing, one thing is like, okay, we have three directions because we live in three dimensions, not four, or maybe four, but. Um, uh, so we have L and M uh, from before, and we can define, you know you know, a radial direction n because there's also a radial quantization condition. I just want to make this comment because we didn't deal with that at all. There, there were no boundary conditions in the, the equation we wrote down before, but in practice there would be, and so in practice you do have, uh, you know, uh, quantization. And so one thing that people sometimes do is they define n and then they say, like, count the number of nodes in the, um, you know, p-mode region and then subtract the number of nodes in the g-mode region. And this is just this kind of stuff that people do. Now, in practice, you can actually like not just use this heuristic. There's like codes like gyre, which I'm sure Lynn kind of knows about. Uh, and uh, they're basically like you take like some stellar model from Mesa or whatever, and then it just actually, I guess, without all these shady approximations, compute what's the what the oscillation modes should actually look like, uh, and then we'll actually like return some discrete omegas. Um, so omega is, is discretized by this uh, radial boundary condition. Okay. Um, one other thing that I want to say is, um, uh, I mentioned this before, but there are two different 
uh, main ways to observe oscillations in a star. Uh, so one of them is photometry. This is basically looking at the star and just watching its brightness for a long period of time and Fourier transforming that. And then there's spectroscopy, which is watching a star for some period of time, but taking a spectrum. Spectroscopy something, okay. <laughs> and and that's, that's a little bit different because that's like you're watching for the, the fluid on the surface of the star moving and receding away from you. And you know, both of these are ways to you know, measure oscillations. But the problem is, right, um, so it's very hard to measure uh, essentially modes which are bigger than about this. Basically, we just can't do it. It's like impossible, except for the sun, right? Um, because if you think about it, a star, if I have a star, and then it's got like a very uh, high angular you know, wave number, then the brightness is barely going to change because you know this part's going to be slightly more bright because its temperature perturbation is higher, and this one's going to be slightly less bright. But then they're like going to cancel out essentially. And the only way that they wouldn't cancel out is if the this wave number is very low, right? If the if it's like a dipole oscillation, then it could very conceivably uh, be detected, right? Um, yeah, there's this scaling relation that I don't really care about, but apparently the amplitude goes as like one over square root of l. There's some reference for this in the notes. Uh, and some uh, missions to know about are, you know, I think Kepler is a really big one. Kuros is a big one. And now TESS is also doing astro seismology, which is nice. Uh, these are sort of um, big surveys that look at stars for an extended period of time and uh, are able to get information. OK. Uh, any questions? Yes. So when you talk about spectroscopy, are we measuring like the different elemental composition of fluid packets at the surface or like Doppler shifts to their movements? Uh, yeah, I care about the Doppler shift. Okay. So you, I guess you find a line and then you, um, you know, I guess I'm just guessing because I, I don't do this, but I guess like it splits and then something like that. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free to stop me at any time. So, um, so far I've sort of motivated I've written on the equation, here's what an oscillation could look like, but how do we actually like get information, right? Like, Because at the end of the day, you get some spectrum, how are you going to translate that spectrum into information that you actually care about? Okay, so um, let me just first of all draw what a spectrum might look like. Spectra will look quite different depending on what you're looking at, but for me, I specifically care about red giants, and because I'm giving the talk, I get to decide that we all care about it. Um, and so let's say that I took uh, a light curve and I Fourier transform it. Uh, then this is the Fourier transform, uh, like like you know, the power spectrum. And this is like let's say this is the you know oscillation frequency. And we're going to observe it something like this. You're going to get spikes, um, and you're going to get like you know different spikes for different L basically. You know, in, in principle, they are degenerate with L, uh, with M. Um, you know, unless there's rotation or something. Uh, basically, what you'll have is this big envelope over here. Okay, and at the, and the the amplitude is sort of maximized at some new max, I guess like two pi new max in this picture, whatever. Uh, and then there's also going to be this spacing, which is sort of the spacing between modes of equal L. Okay, this is what you'd observe. Um, so if you look in the notes, there's like an actual um, data set. And um, so these are, this is called delta nu. This is called the um, frequency of maximum power. And this is called the large frequency spacing. And uh, these observables are kind of interesting because it turns out that they encode a lot of useful information about the star. Um, and this is going to sound very shady, but we can try and estimate what these things are, right? So um, one thing I should say, so first let's do new max. So new max, as I said, is sort of like the, the uh, frequency at which the modes are most driven. So before we did a calculation, uh, where we solved for what modes can exist, but just because a mode can exist doesn't mean it does exist in the sense of like 
it, it might not be driven by whatever is driving the oscillation, so you might not see it. And so this is clearly a reflection that there is a thing which drives the oscillation modes, and that thing is um, only is like most powerful here. Okay. And what is that thing? In a red giant, what it is is um, basically if you imagine the convective envelope of your star, you get you get like these giant blobs of gas that move up and down. And um, like because of the convective instability at some characteristic frequency, and that will basically cause um, you know driving of your of your oscillation modes. And um, so we can estimate just very roughly how we expect that to scale with our quantities. So one thing you can do is you can say, okay, what is the characteristic um, speed at which those blobs move? That's like the speed of sound, right? I can't think of another frequency that I like more than that. So why not? And then we can say like, okay, how, how over that over with that speed, how how much do they move before they turn around? Well, I can only think of the length scale, the pressure scale height, for some reason. So why not? And then what we can do is we can say, uh, you know, CS, you know, is just basically square root of p over rho, roughly speaking, and and that's like kt over m. Uh, Wait, is this is this the right way right way around? Let me think. What have I? Oh yeah, that's that that should be okay. Actually, let me do this. So the pressure scale height is um, p over rho g. And so what this is going to be is um, you know g over square root of p rho but using the uh, ideal gas relation, which is P is equal to rho kT over m. This is basically proportional to G uh, T effective. So if we're looking at the surface of the star, it's G T effective to the minus a half. And G is like, you know, m r minus two T effective to the half. So this is the scaling we roughly expect. Sky. P effective just comes from the color of the star, so you can just you know do photo photometry and figure out what that is. Uh, and then we have this guy, delta nu. And in order to see how we can estimate that, we can think, okay, if I have like a well, then I have you know the first harmonic here, and the second harmonic here, and the third harmonic here, and that's they're basically separated by you know one over the crossing time. Uh, you no, know, because this is like one frequency, and this is like two frequencies, and they're the the amount that you know, the difference is, um, you know, how long it takes the wave to, to go across. So we can roughly do that. We can say, okay, how long does it take for a sound wave to uh, travel across the whole star? Okay, why not? Uh, and this is, uh, if you sort of put in p over, square root of p over rho, you put in r, uh, which is just r, you'll get this thing, g rho bar, which is like, um, you know, the mean density. And uh, this is going to be proportional to m to the uh, one half r to the minus three halves. This is your second guy. And uh, one thing is interesting is that both of these guys scale in very you know they scale you know this way with m and r, but they scale in different ways. So crucially, what that means is. Uh, if you have a good calibration, like you base it off the sun, even though it's not a red giant or whatever, or you use another measure to figure out how to calibrate this relation, you can basically measure these two things and then know what M and R are. You, of course, you have to know the color, but this is usually not that big of a deal. Uh, and so it's kind of cool that you can look at a red giant, or, or not, this is, I guess, um, yeah. At least you can look at a red giant, you can, uh, take its oscillation spectrum, measure these two things, and you'll know what the mass and the radius are, sometimes to a pretty good degree of precision. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, any questions about that? So this is like sort of bulk information about the star. That's kind of interesting because, you know, obviously if you look at a star, you look at a point source, um, you think like it's quite difficult to know this information, but it turns out to be, um, you know, encoded in these two quantities. Okay, um, so one of the things I motivated this presentation with was uh, trying to say like, uh, we, we should also be able to get information about what's inside the star. 
And there is an observable for that too. Now I'm not going to go into the details of where this formula comes from because I quite honestly don't really understand, but it's fine. Um, basically, uh, what happens is when you have, uh, you know, uh, when you're very, when you have mixed modes, basically, if I zoom in over here, like you know, I draw a box, like each of these spikes will like split, but they'll they won't split evenly in frequency space. They'll split evenly in like period, it turns out. So this is something called the period spacing, the G mode period spacing. And um, it's just this thing. And this is over like, uh, you know, basically, the, basically it's the radiative region, you know. Uh, I think you can just say it's like this, you know, the region, uh, where you're like driving is like roughly less than like in the gravity mode regime, this kind of thing. So you measure this, um, and you can basically get information. Uh, like this is sort of like intuitively integral over, like, the the thing that causes the G modes to happen. And so by measuring this, you have you have a measure of like this integral essentially. And that's kind of interesting. I, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, what we've done in our group because maybe you've heard about what. Uh, we do, and maybe this makes it a little bit more intuitive. So uh, Jim and I actually wrote a proposal, or wrote a paper which proposed uh, measuring this thing and figuring out the mass of the core, essentially, because you know, of the interior structure of your star is going to be different, and it's going to reflect in a different uh, period spacing. And the thing is, if you have a red giant, and um, like I, let's say I have a big star, like big being 2.5 solar masses, it collapses, uh, it sort of becomes a red giant, so it develops a core. Uh, it turns out at this regime, you'll get like a non-degenerate core that's pretty massive. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a smaller red giant, so you have a star which is like this, uh, 1.5, and it becomes a red giant, so what's gonna happen is it has to collapse more because reasons. It has a not. It has a degenerate core. Turns out it reaches this regime before, um, you know, something gas pressure stops it, and uh, it's less massive. And then what happens is if I like later I get a you know main sequence star that like gets sub you know that like gets eaten like via common envelope evolution or something and it becomes bigger. The core doesn't really change all that much. Turns out. And so the basic um, thing that we proposed was um, basically measuring this thing and like figuring out whether or not the core is the right mass that it has to be and it turns out you can look for candidates and there are some and so that's been of some interesting um, you know recent intrigue i think um, so this sort of contextualizes you know one possible uh you know application of this stuff of course you know you can put all sorts of constraints on other stuff um okay so i'm at section three now so uh anyone have any questions We've now reached the point of like, the rest of this is optional. So, yeah. So, in this, you are assuming a, an equation of state for ideal gas and stuff? Yeah. Is there a way with astro seismology to probe the equation of state, or is that not uh, a thing to do with red giants? Probably. I mean, like, let's see. Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah, so, let me think about this. There should be something like neutron star astro seismology. There is neutron star astro seismology. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's a way to determine the equation of state. Yeah, I'm just sort of thinking about it. Because so okay, so the I ideal gas law. So there's two things here. So there's an ideal gas law and there's the equation of state, which I said was like this, right? Yeah. I'm just sort of thinking about that because it might be weird because if you linearize this equation, gamma is just like d ln p over d ln rho, you know, whatever this is. And it might, I'm just thinking if you linearize it, it may not tell you actually what the functional form of this is. But I have to think about that. Okay. I, I don't know. People do do neutron star astro seismology. Yeah, but neutron stars are so different from like main sequence stars that it's, the methods would be so so different. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's true. But if you look at what we've done, right? Like neutron stars have pressure, neutron stars have buoyancy. 
they have shear too on the surface, and so that's a bit complicated. But let's just forget about that and then <laughs> like say that maybe this analysis is not all that specific, right? Can't okay. you, compute, you can compute gamma from the composition, right? Like, uh, the, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yo, by that token, would knowing the equation of constraint, uh, constrain the equation, the equation of state constrain a mass radius relationship, or is there some other factor that? Um, I don't know. Let me let me think about this. So, where does first of all, I'm just trying to think where gamma only enters in the sound speed and in n. I'm not sure like how much of a constraint you actually get on it. Maybe you do get a constraint on gamma, but I'm not sure. In any case, I think neutron star astrocyte homology is probably pretty hard to do. People like write papers where they're like, okay, like um, there's a paper called like ocean G modes, like on like the surface of a neutron star or something, and they'll just basically say like, oh, like we predict frequencies, oscillation frequencies, which are like in line with the variability of what's happening, and then that may turn out to be like just gas falls onto it or something, <laughs> and then you know, so. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. I don't think, like, basically the most observation has taken place with red giants just because that's the easiest. Um, but, um, you know, neutron stars are cool too, I guess. <laughs> I, think, I think in general, like, equation of state things, like, screw up. Uh, like, anything you try and do, so people try and get universal relations that are independent of the equation mm -hmm. of state, and then do astroseismology with the universal relations. Oh, yeah. I'm sure it's hard also because everything's Newtonian on top of all of the other dumb approximations we've made. So, <laughs> but you know, I'm gonna pretend that that's not an issue because I think that's usually okay. okay for main sequence stars and red giants. Yeah, yeah, for yeah, for stars, it's definitely okay, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. I wanted to say a few more things, but it's all optional, so please stop me at any time. What do I want to say? Okay. So, what if you care about other stuff? What if you care about rotation? Things in space rotate. Actually, everything rotates. We were just saying that it didn't, but you know, we, we should. Uh, maybe consider what happens when things rotate possibly very quickly. So uh, if you have rotation, you have the Coriolis force, which is proportional to omega. And if you have you know, the centrifugal force, that's proportional to omega squared, because you know, it's like v squared over r or something. Uh, and let's just say that omega is small, so we can ignore this. You know, this is already going to be a hard problem without doing that. Uh, and it turns out that if you apply WKG approximation in all your directions, you'll get a um, dispersion relation which looks like this, kh squared. Uh, and here I'm, speci I'm specifically specializing to gravity waves because those are the coolest. Um, Um, yeah, and so if you look at this thing, you're like, okay, there's like basically a k done with an omega, and if you're in the gravity wave regime, it tends to be that kr is much bigger than kh, uh, and therefore maybe it's the case that we actually don't care, like there's, an, there's like this, omega uh, cosine theta r hat minus omega sine theta theta hat, and Maybe it's the case that we actually don't care about this component, like because you know this dot product is dominated by kr, this thing. This approximation is called the traditional approximation. I don't know why. I don't know what's traditional about it. I didn't think of it. My parents didn't teach it to me. Um, but it's not a traditional approximation. It's the traditional approximation. Okay. Um, and if you are a little bit more careful and you, only, and you make this assumption, you don't assume the WKB approximation except in the radial direction, it turns out you'll, you won't have the Legendre equation anymore because you break your azimuthal symmetry. Instead, you'll have this. So you get this guy.
and then you know this is like an icon from it. Okay, uh, this is called the Laplace tidal equation. And if you want to believe all the approximations we've made, you know, then this is like this will tell you basically the horizontal dependence of your, you know, fit, you know, fit, you know, um, functions. And it, these are called Huff functions. And for those who are interested in like what I've been doing, basically just erase this term, and that's what I've been doing uh, for my system. Uh, there are some things here that there are some you know properties of Huff functions that I'm not going to talk about because we don't have any time. But I do want to briefly mention magnetism because that's near and dear to my heart. By which it means, by which I mean, it has been incredibly uh, mean to me, and I have to pretend to like it. So rotation's cool, I guess. Things rotate. I guess neutron stars rotate. Have fun with that one. Um, When you have magnetism, you make the same approximation here, you make the WKB approximation, you'll get this guy. And this guy is sometimes called the alpha frequency. Okay. Um, and so you can see that if, if there's no magnetism, this is just a gravity wave. Um, but one thing you can do is um, you can say, and this is some work that Jim did actually, you can say, suppose KR is much bigger than KH. What I'm saying is basically this is KR, this is KR, uh, and you'll, you'll get omega squared is equal to KH squared over KR squared, N squared, minus KR squared VA R squared. Uh, and you can multiply this KR out, and you can basically get a quadratic formula for KR squared, and you will get this guy, kr squared is equal to some stuff that doesn't honestly matter all that much, and the important thing to know is that there's a square root here. You should be very careful because this could be imaginary. Oh no, it, it sometimes is. And so if you, you know, it turns out that um, when you're when you have omega is smaller than this thing, so k h v a r n, then you basically like under this approximation, you can't have uh, radially propagating waves anymore. You only have evanescent waves. And this is kind of interesting because observationally we have this issue that if you look at some red giants, um, you know most of them are like normal. That's by the definition of the word normal. But like um, there's like a large minority of them which are have dipole oscillations which are suppressed and higher order oscillations which are suppressed. And the um, the canonical picture is that you have a magnetic field somewhere inside your star, uh, and something like this, you know, causes your oscillations to damp out somehow. Who knows how? Apparently it's my job, but uh, I can't tell you the answer to that because I'm not good at it. So um, yeah, that's everything basically I wanted to talk about. You know, So I hope I've given you a little bit of a dive into what astroseismology is, You know, the important formulae, basically why we want to do it, what you can learn from it, um, and you can imagine there's more stuff to learn from it, uh, and um, you know, just cool stuff. Uh, that you know follows from it. So, any any questions about anything at all? Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> so, uh, next time, the so next time is two weeks from now, and what's going to happen is Kieran is going to tell us about uh, the beautiful language of Julia, which I do not <laughs> know, and he's going to build an automatic differentiation engine. And after that, two weeks after that, which is a month from now, we'll have Hamanchu tell us about something. I don't know what yet. <laughs> uh, and then after that, we don't have anyone booked. So if you want to give a topic about anything, you know, looking at some people who might know things, uh, sign up and like you know, let me know. Or there's a form that I send out.